everyone, and thanks for tuning in to God Size Stories. Well, this week I have a treat for you. I sat down to talk to New York best-selling author Lee Strobel. He is best known for the Case for Christ, which is really his account of how he became a Christian after being an atheist all his life. It is a book that has sold millions of copies worldwide along with other books that follow. He's the author of over 40 books. Well, we sat down, we had a great conversation about heaven. And that's the subject of his book, The Case for Heaven, and the movie that is releasing in theaters on April 3rd. So sit down, grab a cup of coffee, and enjoy my conversation with Lee Strobel. pleasure today to be sitting down with Mr. Lee Strobel. Uh, I don't, you really don't need much of an, intro, an, an introduction, Mr. Strobel. Can I, should I call you Lee? Yes, please. <laughs> All right. All right. Awesome. Well, you don't need much of an introduction. You are probably the most famous atheist, atheist turned Christian in the world. I'm sure. So most, every, <laughs> most everybody have heard about your walk, about your about um, your story, which is amazing. You became a Christian trying to really disprove the legitimacy of Messiah. And right. uh, so I, you know, just a little bit about what about Lee Strobel. He is a former award winning legal editor of the Chica the Chicago Tribune and he is a New York best-selling author of more than 40 books and cur curricula. And he, his books have sold over 14 million copies worldwide. And I was just talking to him that uh, he actually is in, his books are translated to, to Portuguese, which I, yeah. I bought a copy of it for my, my father-in-law years ago of uh, the is, case for Is Christ. it a good translation? Because there's no way I can tell when I, it's translated to another language. I can't tell if it's good or bad. It is. It's a very okay. good translation. As a matter of fact, Brazil, I'm very proud of Brazilian translators like the books that uh, American books you know, or English books that are uh, translating to Portuguese are very, very true to the, oh, to the language. The hardest one is Max Lucado. To tra to, his translations are a little hard because he's so poetic in his... Yeah in yes. his narrative that uh, sometimes I think he loses a little bit, you know, uh, but, but it's yeah. still pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> Mine's so, a little more uh, journalistic, so maybe it makes really it is. It's investigative. <laughs> it's just amazing, which I love that. I'm, I love facts. <laughs> so, oh. And that's actually, you know, I am a former, I'm, I'm a former skeptical. I, I was, uh, you know, I was raised as a Catholic, but really not practicing Catholic at all. And so I really, I don't think I believed in anything. I was not an atheist, but, you know, I just said I believed God because that's how I was raised. But but uh, I also was one of those people that when I, I believe in Christ by faith, but I wanted to know that what I was believing was true. And I know that that translates a little bit of your experience. So um, I the name of my show is God Size Story and stories and yours is definitely a god-sized stories <laughs> so i would like to see if you would share just a brief testimony i know we're going to talk about your brand new movie and the book um but uh, i would love for you to just share a quick testimony of how you came to christ yeah i was an atheist for much of my life uh, my background's in journalism and law my wife was i would say agnostic just kind of spiritually confused uh, she met a woman who was a Christian and a nurse. Uh, they became best friends. And this woman brought Leslie, my wife, to church with her and answered her questions. And then Leslie came and gave me the worst news that uh, an atheist husband could get. She said, I've decided to become a follower of Jesus. And um, my first reaction was to get a divorce. But um, instead, I stuck around and I thought maybe I could rescue her from this cult that she's gotten involved in. 
So I decided to take my journalism training and legal training and systematically investigate the resurrection of Jesus because I realized that's the linchpin of Christianity. Mm -hmm. uh, Jesus um, claimed to be the son of God, clearly, but so what? I could make that claim. Anybody could claim that they're God. But Jesus not only made that claim, he died and then three days later returned from the dead and thus proved that he is who he claimed to be. So I spent two years of my life uh, investigating various aspects of the faith, but especially the resurrection of Jesus. Until on November the 8th of 1981, um, I, I thought, you know, the evidence is in. I got to reach a verdict. And I reviewed all the evidence. And then as I stepped back, I realized in light of this avalanche of evidence that points so powerfully toward the truth of Christianity, I realized it would take more faith to maintain my atheism <laughs> than to become a Christian. In other words, the scales just went like that. Mm -hmm. and, um, I concluded it is true. And uh, based on that, um, I confessed my sin, received forgiveness through Christ and uh, became uh, a Christian on that day, a follower of Jesus. And, and, and my values, my character, my morality, my priorities, my attitudes, my relationships, I mean, everything over time um, yes. began to change for the good. Absolutely. I actually, I, I interviewed several people and, and that's, that's like a, the, it's the same line of every story is yeah. that Jesus turn, a, turn our lives upside down, you know, yeah. and especially those people like me and you and, and I who have come to Christ as, as an adult already yes. with a huge life and a, lo a long time behind yeah. us and a lot of things that were ingrained in, in our yeah. day to day. And it's amazing. It's not, it's not a legalism. It's he really turns your heart and your life around. So He really does. I, I did a book called The Case for Grace a few years mm -hmm. ago, where I told stories of uh, people whose lives were turned upside down. One of my favorite stories, I don't think it's in that book, but a friend of mine, Tom Terrance, had been a Ku Klux Klan a terrorist um, oh. years ago and was um, arrested in a shootout with the FBI. Uh, when he was trying to bomb the house of a civil rights leader in the South. Uh, he went to prison, uh, maintained his racist attitudes, escaped from prison, another shootout. Uh, his accomplice uh, both times was killed. Uh, he went back to prison, but then somebody sent him a Bible. His grandmother sent him a Bible and he read it and he realized that uh, he could not be a racist and be a Christian at the same time. Absolutely. He came to faith and... Um, when he was released from prison, he ended up getting his uh, doctor of ministry degree, uh, became pastor of a racially mixed church and uh, president of the C.S. Lewis Society in Washington, D.C. So there's a life, uh, <laughs> my friend Tom, that was absolutely transformed from yeah. racist to God loving um, um, pastor of a multiracial church. Um, that's amazing you look at that and you say only god does only that. god can do that that's exactly right and you know it that is the the the, the biggest testimony the biggest uh, sermon that we can ever preach is with our lives you know it's just like when god turns somebody like a, a cookless clan person that yeah. now is a leader of a, of a multiracial church and, right, and right. an atheist who is just bringing light and uh, you became really a great apologist for because you you had to investigate deeply and that that's in your heart that's in your dna to investigate yeah. uh, the cases and you have several books really um who, who are which are like the case for case for right? right you have the case for christ the case for faith the case for a creator and the case for grace did i miss any and then we have the case uh, of for miracles right for miracles, right and case now this the case for easter the case for Easter, and now we have the case for heaven. Right. So that is the subject, the main subject of what we are talking about today, because just like you had the case for Christ uh, became a movie in 2017. By the way, I loved it. I love that movie. It was a great movie. Also sent to my, my, my stepdad, of course. <laughs> I'm just sending everything I can, but uh, but I, I love the movie. It was beautifully done, and I just watched, of course, the preview of the case for heaven. So I want to ask you, um, what what was the draw? What what made you uh, want to write the case for heaven and the case for Christ? I know that there is a personal story behind that too. 
Well, yeah, I um, almost died several years ago. Uh, my wife found me unconscious. Uh, she called an ambulance. I woke up in the emergency room and the doctor looked down at me and said, you're one step away from a coma, two steps away from dying. And then I went unconscious again. I had an unusual medical condition called hyponatremia, which mm. is a severe drop in blood sodium level. And I hovered between life and death for quite a while until the doctors were able to save my life. And I found that to be a very clarifying experience uh, because when you're, when you're facing uh, the possibility of death and you don't know if you're gonna close your eyes and never open them again in this world, the question of the afterlife becomes paramount. Nothing mm -hmm. is more important than what happens after this life. And so as a Christian, I believe what the Bible teaches about the afterlife. But again, I've got that skeptical gear and uh, I decided to take my journalism and legal uh, training and investigate what is the evidence that indeed we do continue to live on uh, after this life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and th th it was a really interesting movie. And you took some, some chance on that movie, bringing about a lot of also uh, information that's not necessarily in the Bible, right? So, yeah. and we know uh, anybody that has heard about near-death experiences, which uh, you explore, really well on this movie and um, you, you do this you, you brought a lot of that information as well so tell yeah. me what you found out that the bible doesn't say about the the, the heaven but uh investigatively, investigatively speaking you believe it's true yeah i mean i was a skeptic about near-death experiences i thought that this was just the uh, brain being starved of oxygen and so people had hallucinations or something and there was, um, but then I found that there have been over 900 scholarly articles published in scientific and medical journals over the last 50 years on near-death experiences. This is a well-researched area. In fact, the Lancet, which is the famous journal, medical journal in England, carried an analysis that showed that none of these alternative explanations can account for the phenomenon of near-death experiences. And so, as you say, there've been some fraud, there've been people who've made up stories. And so I was skeptical and I thought, I'm only gonna look at those cases where we have corroboration, mm -hmm. confirmation that indeed someone did have an out-of-body experience after their clinical death. And I found multiple cases where we have corroboration. Mm -hmm. um, my favorite one involves a woman named Maria who died in the hospital, clinically dead. And yet she said later, I was conscious the whole time. And she said, I watched as the, um, um, the nurses and doctors tried to revive my body, but my spirit was floating uh, toward the ceiling of the room. I'm watching this. And then I floated up and out of the hospital. And when she was finally revived and her spirit returned to her body, she said, oh, by the way, there's a man's tennis shoe on the roof of the hospital. And it's left footed, it's dark blue. There's some wear over the little toe and the shoelace is tucked under the heel. And so they go up in the roof and they find it just as she described it. So that's the kind of corroboration I was looking for. And I found multiple cases where mm -hmm. we have that kind of corroboration. For instance, there was one study done of nearly a hundred near-death experiences where people made these kind of verifiable observations during their near-death experience, during their out-of-body experience. And they found that 92% of these observations were absolutely accurate. Another 6% were almost exactly accurate. So that is an incredible rate of accuracy. And then I looked at a study of 21 blind people who mm -hmm. had near-death experiences, many of them blind since birth. And yet during their near-death experiences, they were able to see. Oh my Maybe goodness. The first time. Yeah. One, one woman, her name was Vicky. She was killed in a car accident and she had, was blind virtually since birth. And she described watching the resuscitation efforts taking place on her body. She saw uh, birds for the first time, saw trees for the first time. And then when she was revived, her blindness returned. My goodness, well, I got goosebumps yeah. on that. Isn't that amazing? That's amazing. I know. It's, that's a, it's just I, I, I'm assuming that that's in your book, The Miracle that's for Heaven. Yes, because of course, the, the movie can only 
you only have so much, so many, you know, so many stories you can tell in ninety minutes. But exactly. Uh, but yeah. so the, the I'm I'm gonna get the book because it sounds really amazing. I it's fascinating. It's fascinating. fascinating. I actually, it's funny because uh, it's so funny. I was just in Brazil in December and I was looking for. I always try to buy, buy some Portuguese books to read. Sure. Uh, when I come home and I came, and I bought this one and it's uh, I had never heard of this of this uh, author it's called Joan Myers um, and the, the name is uh, Voices from the Edge of Eternity and it's just stories about I mean all the way from the 1700s uh, 1500s of stories of people that the near-death experiences too like that yeah. uh, and I was like uh, it's just fascinating my father um, 20 years ago he had a surgery and he started um, losing a lot of blood and his heart stopped and he had a near-death experience on the operation table where he literally could see his body um, yes. down, you know, and he Classic. came back and he told the, the doctors what they were doing and the things that they yes. were saying. And he yes. said that the, he said it was the, the most interesting. He said all of a sudden he saw this big light and, yes. and then he had these two hands that put the hands on his shoulder, the hands put like somebody somebody put their hands yeah. on his shoulders and pull him back down to the table wow. like that and he tells the story and it was like life-changing to him as well that, so. that, that's a classic classic example you know the most interesting thing i discovered about near-death experiences i interviewed for the movie and the book uh, john burke who was a christian pastor mm -hmm. but he studied a thousand near-death experiences over 30 years and his conclusion is, if you look at what actually takes place in a typical near-death experience, not how people interpret it, because people can see things through their own cultural lens or religious lens, but you look at what actually takes place, it's consistent with Christian theology. That was a real fascinating discovery. Those are the things that, that make you want to shout. You know, yeah. anytime <laughs> that you, you hear things like that and, and it just absolutely matches with what scripture says one yeah. of the things that i remember of the document or the the movie that is releasing next week by the way uh, and my my podcast will be will be up next week as well so um was the the sounds and the colors and the things because we do know that um the heaven has colors that it's a different dimension right and yeah. i love that i have never seen somebody explore that part of heaven of imagining yeah. what how was that that for you that experience well you know the bible says no eye has seen no ear has heard no mind is mm -hmm. conceived of what god has in store for those who love him and so heaven is going to be so different for us that the bible um uses a lot of metaphors and um figurative language to try to uh, give us a glimpse of it mm -hmm. but a, a good example is colors because in our world we see a color spectrum that's based on the light from the sun mm -hmm. but in heaven the color spectrum would be based on the light of god so we will see colors in heaven and by the way some near-death experience people have seen these um mm -hmm. colors that we don't have in this world that we've right. never seen before so there's no way the Bible can tell you this is the, what the color is you're going to see because <laughs> you can't explain it. So yeah. I think it's going to be such an otherworldly experience, such a powerful and, and loving and, and, and physical experience that the Bible uses a lot of this imagery to kind of hint at what we'll see. Um, yes. And my, one of my favorite examples of that is when Jesus uses the metaphor of a home where he's mm -hmm. talking disciples he said there's 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 room for you in my father's home and i was thinking you know if you've ever traveled internationally perhaps to a to a third world country where things are mm -hmm. difficult like i went to india as a new christian and you know you're sleeping on the ground you're living out of a knapsack you're eating strange foods and and you begin to long for home and you right. get this sickness and when you finally return home and you walk in the door and it's such a place of warmth and comfort and security and love and jesus says that's what i want you to think about when you think about heaven i yeah. love that. i love that too i love the thought that that we you know we're going to meet the people we should all of us have people that we love who, who went before us and yes. that, uh, you know, just that reunion alone, I look forward to, yes. you know, in all of the goodness of heaven. That's amazing. Um, 
Well, uh, you have some pretty cool people in this in this movie. I loved it. So some of these are some of my really favorite uh, authors as well. You mentioned Joan Burke from Imagine Heaven, which is yes. a, a book that when we lost uh, Steve's, uh, my, my husband's uh, brother, that was one of the books that really comforted my sister-in-law, I know. Um, past, uh, the pastor and best-selling author of Crazy Love, Francis Chan, who is, yeah. he's yeah. amazing. Dr. Yeah. Clay Jones, who is a, yeah. an amazing apologist as well. And yeah. uh, among others, uh, other wonderful interviews so what are some of your favorite interviews from the movies and why tell me well my favorite one is kind of unusual um for my book i did an interview with uh, luis palau mm -hmm. the um often called the billy graham of latin america he was he shared his faith with a billion people during his life through his crusades and his uh, rallies and festivals around the world uh, he was my hero and my friend and he was diagnosed with stage four cancer he knew he was going to die. And so I went to his home to interview him as someone who's getting ready to die soon. What, what would that be like? And um, so what was interesting is when I do my interviews for, for my book, I tape record them so I can be accurate. Um, and then we wanted to come back and film it for the documentary. But he died in the interim. I had the last major interview with him before he mm -hmm. died. So in the film, you hear his voice. Uh, when we play the tape, uh, but you, you, you don't see him uh, physically speaking. But the thing he said to me, and I don't think this is in the movie, it's in the book. Um, the most powerful thing Luis Palau said to me, right before he died, he looked at me and he said, Lee, when you get to the end of your life and all is said and done, you will never regret being courageous for Christ. Wow. And I, that that was powerful for me and i think every christian you know what what it means for the average christian to be courageous is different for every Absolutely. person you know it, and, it and, for, and for and for someone like you who is you know who is so well known and so you are exposed so much in the world i can only imagine especially from the atheist community how much backlash you must have experienced in this 30 plus years that you where you have been advocating for Christ and against what they don't believe, I guess. You yeah, know? Yeah. So I can only so I, I imagine coming from one of your close friends, how yeah. much that meant to you just to say, listen, Lee, keep up you know, being courageous, yeah. do not, you know, do not worry about the naysayers, do those who want to destroy your testimony because he, he, i'm close to heaven and i'll tell you i don't regret a thing i said yeah so i did you know, you're exactly right but it's true i think for all, every christian i think we're called to be salt and light to be influencers in our culture and whatever mm -hmm. sphere relationships god has put us in you know for some people being courageous might mean um inviting somebody to come to the case for heaven movie with you who's not a christian Mm -hmm. And that's a risky thing to do. You, you feel uncomfortable. Would you, you want to come to a movie about heaven? I know you don't believe in God, but or, or to give them a copy of the book and to say, you know, I was just listening to a, uh, an interview with a guy who was an atheist and became a Christian and he wrote a book called The Case for Heaven. Would you be interested? And that's a courageous thing to do, to mm -hmm. give that to someone who, who may say, no, I don't want to read that or, you know, you know, I don't believe. So back mm -hmm. off. So I think we can all be courageous in our own realm and, um, uh, uh, and be, be a strong salt and bright light wherever God puts us. Very true. Very true. It's a call for all of us Jesus, from Jesus himself to be bold and, and courageous. Yes. Now, this is the second time that one of your books has turned into a movie. Yeah. Uh, the first one was The Case for Christ. So how did this experience, how was it different from the first one? Well, the first one was a, a feature film where we had actors and actresses. Um, it was um, based on the true story. Um, um, and so it was kind of the uh, more of a Hollywood take on, on my story. Uh, this is a documentary. And I hesitate to use that term because then people mm -hmm. think, oh, it's a grainy black and white uh, head talking head movie. No, it's a beautiful. The cinematography in this film is beautiful. It really but it, is. It was totally unscripted. I didn't know what he was going to say to me, what he was going to ask me, the director, Manny Sandoval, who uh, made the movie. Um, mm -hmm. Nothing was scripted. 
Um, and wow. we went from coast to coast. We went from Washington, D.C. to the coast of Oregon. We went to um, Sedona, Arizona, to Chicago, to Louisiana. The team went over to England, to Cambridge, to interview a neuroscientist. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's a beautiful film. That's why I hope people could see it on the big screen, because the, the cinematography is breathtaking. Um, it is. It I, really is. Isn't that amazing? They just I, did a great job. So they did. You made me want to go to Oregon. I've never been to Oregon, yeah. but that I'm, those scenes in, in Oregon, I'm like, oh my yes. God, take me there. I'm taking my family there for vacation this summer oh. because I'd never been there before. And it was so beautiful when we were there. I said, you've got to come. So oh my, my grandchildren uh, and my wife and I are going to spend some time there this summer. Uh, yeah, it's, it, it, it's breathtaking. Breathtaking. It reminded a little bit uh, of the coast of Brazil because Brazil has that same scenario of like uh, be beaches and then you look to the other side and there's mountains, you know, yes. and that's breathtaking. That contrast, you know, it's beautiful. Yeah. I loved it. Now, um, when, tell us, we, we're almost out of time. So I just wanna, want you to tell people where they can see this movie, where they can find yeah. out more about the movies, where to purchase tickets and uh, where to see the case of Hev for heaven. Yeah, it's in motion, it's in um, a movie um, theaters, coast to coast uh, for just three nights, um, April 4th, 5th and 6th. Um, and if you go to thecaseforheavenmovie.com, you can see the trailer and uh, you can put in your zip code and see the local theater showing it and uh, get your tickets that way. I just I just went on and bought a whole bunch of tickets. I'm going to take a whole bunch of people. On right. And, um, um, you know, I hope people take a risk and yes. find someone who's spiritually curious. Absolutely. I'm going to be taking my family myself because oh, it, was, it was definitely worth it. I will put all the information about Lee and, uh, and, and the movie on, on the the show notes and i invite everybody to see i've seen it already no i'm not going to give you a lot of spoiler alerts just okay. that it's a must see it's really a great movie to see and to take the entire family and friends this was such a blessing for me lee to uh, to get to see you and meet you um and talk to you this is really a blessing i, I appreciate I really the time i really enjoyed it thank you so much for having oh, and me you're so welcome. You said that you had never met a Brazilian. Now you can say you have. I, I can. And now it makes me want to go visit Brazil. <laughs> oh, you should. If you like to Oregon, you need to go to the coast of Brazil. I, be... I'm going to put it on my bucket list. <laughs> hey, believe me, there will be a lot of people coming to see you if you come speak there. <laughs> good, good to know. <laughs> well, it's a blessing talking to you. Um, li listen, Godspeed in all your future Um future projects i'm sure that there are many more to come and you are a blessing to the kingdom of god and i appreciate you well thank you and thank you for what you're doing and blessings to you and all your listeners and viewers thank you so much lee my pleasure you have a wonderful rest of your day thank you you too blessings to you you too take care